Ken here with you once again. We're up to DC lesson, and this is part A. So about this chapter, or about this particular lesson, explains the factors that determine the resistance of a conductor. And if you're wanting to follow on from the textbook, it's section 5.1, factors that determine resistance. So there are four basic factors that determine resistance. These are worth noting, that what the material is made from, and a term we often use to describe that is the resistivity. So depending what it's made from will determine how well it conducts electricity. The next is the length of the conductor. It's like putting lots of little conductors, what we call in series, one after the other. So the length of the conductor will affect its resistance. Also the cross-sectional area, and that's a bit like putting uh, resistance values in parallel. And we'll be looking at cross-sectional area as it affects resistance. Temperature, with some materials, the uh, resistance of the material goes up with temperature. That's called a PTC or positive temperature coefficient. Sometimes the temperature goes down as temperature goes up, and that's called negative temperature coefficient, or NTC. So that's the four main things. So let's look at the material a conductor is made from. So all conducting materials have a certain value of resistivity, or resistive value. Resistivity is defined as the resistance the material offers between opposite faces of a cube of one meter dimension. So if we had a cube of copper and one of the resistivity, it's simply a one meter cube of copper and we measure the resistance between any two faces that are opposite each other. A resistivity value is expressed in ohm meters. So it's ohms per meter. The symbol for resistivity is the Greek letter pronounced rho. It looks like a lowercase p and we use a lowercase p most of the time, but it's pronounced rho. So if you can remember from a few lessons back, the resistance of a material is directly related to the way the electrons work in any particular conductor. So in a conductor, electrons can easily move from one atom to the next because it has a low valency, but not free. Even with low valence or low energy levels, there are electrons. It takes force to move from one atom to another. It takes some energy. And the energy requirements or the struggle to move an electron from one to the next is called the resistance of the material. And if you remember things like uh, silver which is the very best of all conductors i'll just turn my uh, pen on for a minute here we go turn the pen on uh, silver is the very best because at level five which is the lowest level energy levels work from level one out to whatever in this direction and they're high on the inside where they're closely bound to the nucleus and they're low on the outside. So copper has this, sorry, silver has this one electron sitting at level five. So it is the best conductor. Its energy level is five. Therefore, it's very weak. It's easy to make the electrons skip from one atom to the next. And it has a resistivity of 1.63 ohms times 10 to the minus 8 ohms per meter. Copper is the next best. It's number 2. And uh, again, energy level 4, which is why it is good, but not best. Energy level 4 is still seen as weak giving us a resistivity of 1.72 ohms times 10 to the minus 8 ohms per meter. And then our next one that we use quite often, 
mostly in HV applications is aluminium and it's a relatively poor conductor compared to the others you can see its resistivity is nearly double the other two at 2.83 and uh, its energy level is a 3 making it a poor or it should have been a 3 shouldn't it and moderate energy level so it's a bit closer to the nucleus, a bit harder to drag from, from molecule to molecule or atom to atom. So it's moderate. So as we were mentioning before, here's measuring resistivity. So resistivity is simply taking a cube of whatever the material is. And we've kind of colored this one a color, color of copper and here's a cube of the material and we're just measuring between opposite faces so in this particular case we're measuring across this face compared to the opposite face which i'll quickly sketch in so here's our opposite face over here so that's the opposite face and we're measuring face to face across the cube. It doesn't matter whether we're going horizontally, vertically or back to front because it's a cube and it's the same distance. So resistivity of a material is specified by measuring on the opposite sides of a cube of that material one metre by one meter therefore that's how we get our ohms per meter so here's a table of resistivity to give you some idea of what each of the conductors are capable of as we said silver the best at 1.68 followed by copper at 1.72 you'll notice gold is not an actually a super duper fantastic uh, conductor it's only fractionally better than aluminium so uh, gold's nice and inert it doesn't react with anything else which has its advantages but as a conductor it's not as flash as you might think then we get up to things like tungsten which we use for making um, elements in heaters and light globes um, nichrome 112 and carbon which is not a metal but still a conductor it's at uh, 3.5 so it's somewhere around about a little bit worse than aluminium um, of course at times 10 to the minus 3 it's up uh, far worse than aluminium isn't it so conductor resistance if we turn that into resistance in ohms per kilometer so if this is this is a table that gives us the resistance of the material so if you had one kilometer of wire and it was one millimeter in diameter at a temperature of 20 degrees C this is the values you would get so silver would offer you 20 ohms of resistance copper 21.7 not much difference between silver and copper big jump to gold at 28 Another big jump to 34.4 at aluminium. Tungsten now getting three times as bad at 67 ohms. Nichrome, what's that? Nearly 10 times worse at 1,426. And carbon way, way worse at 4.4 uh, mega ohms of resistance. So as we mentioned before, uh, conductor length is one of the big issues or one of the main factors that affect resistance. And uh, the reason I've put a picture of a set of resistors on, it's like adding resistors one after the other in series. So as length increases, also resistance increases 
So those two things equate. Three horizontal lines means they equate. They are not directly equal, but they equate together. So resistance is proportional to the length of the conductor. So if one millimeter diameter copper conductor has a length of two kilometers, its resistance will be twice that as shown in the previous table. So what we're basically saying is if you were to draw a graph and the bottom was resistance and the horizontal was length, we would end up with a graph that looked like this. As the resistance increases, so too must the length. And conversely, if the length increases, therefore the resistance must also increase. So this is increase in length, this is increase in resistance. And by the way, the slope of the line, so the slope of the line equates to the conductivity of the material being used. So it's like having smaller resistors all connected one after the other in series. So now for cross-sectional area, resistance is inversely proportional to cross-sectional area. That is the smaller the cross-sectional area, the higher the resistance in the conductor. Resistors connected in parallel is kind of an analogous to this. So as the resistance goes down, the more resistors are added. So just before we go to our cross section area, I'll just uh, so we had series resistors before. This time, cross sectional area is like adding resistors together in parallel, it's called. So if we're res adding resistors together like this, this is analogous to cross sectional area. So cross section area conductor, so cross section area can vary if the conductor is nice and square and it's two millimetres by two millimetres, we're going to get a cross section area of four square millimetres. Again, it could be rectangular, it could be four millimetres wide and one millimetre thick, but it's still got a cross section of four millimetres squared. Or, as most electrical conductors tend to be round, if we had a diameter of 2.6 millimetres, then the cross sectional area is 2 pi, sorry, pi d squared divided by 4. Pi d squared divided by 4 for cross sectional area from diameter. So, just a reminder there of what cross sectional area is. So, some examples typical cables. We've got some aluminium stranded cable here, sometimes it's stranded and sometimes it's solid. Here we have copper conductors. So over here on the right hand side, this is a power cable. This is a communications cable, it's a coax cable. This is a telephone cable. This is a uh, signal or data type cable here with the red and the brown conductors, sometimes also thermocouple cable. And this one here is a multi-use cable. It's got data, it's got signal, it's got coax all combined together. 
into one cable. So all of these cables are mostly either made of copper, the vast majority are made of copper, and there are a few, as I said, for high voltage applications that are made of aluminium. So how do we calculate cable resistance? So conductor resistance can be found using the following occasion. R equals rho length divided by area. So R is a resistance in ohms. Rho or little p is the resistivity in ohm meters. That's that value that comes from measuring a whole block of something one meter by one meter by one meter cube. The length, then we divide the whole thing by the cross-sectional area. Now, it's very, very important A to understand the formula, but also to understand the units. The answer is going to be in ohms. The resistivity must be in ohm meters. So you must be careful to make sure you're using ohm meters for resistivity. The length must be in meters. And the cross-sectional area must be in meters squared. A lot of students tend to leave it in, often given to you in millimeters squared, but we've got to convert millimeters squared to meters squared. So it's important to uh, understand the units that we're using. So here's an exercise. What is the resistance of one kilometer of copper cable with a cross-sectional area of two millimeters squared. So let's work through the exercise. Just turn my pen back on. So resistivity of copper from our little table tells us that it's 1.72 times 10 to the minus 8 ohms per meter. Correct units. They've told us that the cross-sectional area, the CSA, is in square millimetres. So we've put in 2, but I've made it times 10 to the minus 6, because that's how many cubic millimetres there are in a cubic metre. So there's 1 million cubic millimetres in a metre. So for every millimetre, it's times 10 to the minus 6. So it's 2 times 10 to the minus 6. So that 2 is in metres squared. It's in the right value, ready to roll. So next is just a matter of doing the calculation. Remember R equals rho L divided by A. So 1.72 multiplied by 10 to the minus 8, multiplied by 1,000, because remember it was 1 kilometre of cable, 1,000 metres of cable, all divided by 2 times 10 to the minus 6, and our resistance value for 1 kilometre of cable at 2 millimetres squared, made of copper, would be 8.6 ohms. So the next thing is going to affect temperature, sorry, resistivity is temperature. So the resistance of all conductors varies with temperature. So for the four pure metals, for pure metals, an increase in temperature will give an increase in resistance, what we call positive temperature coefficient. How much the resistance changes depends on the type of material. So here's a graph that gives you some idea of temperature and resistance. So this particular graph is the graph for a coil of copper wire versus temperature change. If the resistance at 0C is 100 ohms, so just turn my pen back on again. Here's 0C and its resistance is at 
100 ohms. At 200 degrees C, so way up here, it's a 180. And if we go in the opposite direction, let's go down to minus 200 C, that's way down here. Of course, our resistance now has gone down to 30 ohms. So this is called PTC, positive temperature coefficient. As temperature goes up, resistance goes up. As temperature goes down, resistance go down, goes down. So the graph here clearly showing you that relationship for copper. So most conductors have a positive temperature coefficient, which is what we're just talking about. This means their resistance increases as temperature increases. Carbon has a negative temperature coefficient, so its resistance drops with an increase in temperature. It goes the exact opposite direction. So PTC, positive temperature coefficient. NTC, negative temperature coefficient. Carbon being the typical example. So, table of temperature coefficients. So, on the left-hand side, we have the, uh, the different kinds of materials. Silver, copper, gold, aluminium, tungsten, nichrome, and carbon again. And the temperature coefficient per degrees C. So, silver is going to change 0 0.004 of an O for every degrees C change. Copper, very, very similar, 0.0039. It can hardly pick any difference between copper and silver. Even gold at uh, 3.4, not a great deal of difference. Again, aluminium, change in temperature, not a great de deal of difference, the top four. Tungsten, a little bit more, 4.5. Nichrome changes even less at 0.17 and carbon changes its resistance very very small amount with temperature but you'll notice a negative sign because it's going the opposite direction being a negative temperature coefficient. So let's summarize the factors that determine resistance. The four factors that determine resistance are the material from which it is made, and we call that the resistivity. Its length, in other words, the longer it gets, like putting lots and lots of little resistors in series. The cross-sectional areas, like putting resistors in parallel. And the temperature of the material. Some materials, or most of the metals, are positive temperature coefficient, and carbon is an example of negative temperature coefficient. So that ends lesson number five, part A for DC.